One of the themes running through our summit is the importance of supporting the next generation of technology entrepreneurs whose innovative ideas have the potential to make a huge impact on the world. That's going to be at the heart of this discussion with General Atlantic. General Atlantic is a global growth equity investor that's been partnering with leading entrepreneurs and innovative growth companies since 1980, identifying disruptive businesses with transformative potential. My name is Michael Silverton, Global Co-Head of Macquarie Capital, and I'm delighted to be joined by Rob Vorhoff, Managing Director and Head of Healthcare at General Atlantic, to talk about the firm's mission and its work to advance healthcare technologies. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Nice to be here. So starting with GA, pioneers in growth equity. I believe you've invested in over 400 companies over the 40-year history. Can you give us an idea of what do you look for in, in these companies? What, what, what represents an attractive growth equity investment? Yeah, the, the mandate for the firms really evolved over time. So in the 80s, uh, it was almost entirely enterprise software. In the 90s, it was really technology-enabled uh, businesses as that became more ubiquitous across industries. And really, since the early 2000s, the focus for us has been on thematic growth investing. We're almost always identifying companies that are applying technology to at least enable rapid scalability, but often to drive a, com a sustainable competitive advantage in their space or to address a problem in a different way than the incumbents have. But it really starts out with that strong organic growth profile. We want that growth to be the primary driver of returns for our investors. Um, I think if we look back over the 40 years, it's generated 90 plus percent of the returns has actually been the growth of those companies over time. That's why we call ourselves a growth equity firm. And most of the time, once we've made the investment, it's really step one, then it's working with those companies to think about how to build the best company in the space, capture more market share, hopefully you're in a space that's enjoying good tailwinds to start, and we get the compounding effect of those factors to drive growth over the investment horizon. Healthcare fits very well with the theme of our conference and technology enabling a better future. Uh, can you give us some examples of how that's been applied in healthcare in your investments? Yeah, it's such an exciting time um, in healthcare, the, the application of technology. You're seeing it across all uh, portions of the industry and it's, um, it can be everywhere from enabling uh, population health analytics, um, improving providers, the productivity of providers of care, dramatically improving the patient uh, experience, um, you're seeing cutting edge technologies now being applied across healthcare, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's really uh, changing business models, uh, again, not, not only to enable scalability, but to change the basis of competition, to change the value proposition to the, the consumer or, or the client, um, and to continue to drive uh, a competitive advantage that helps these companies grow even faster than they would otherwise. Right. And some recent examples of companies you've invested in that have those new technologies? Uh... Well, I'll give you a, a handful. So um, two themes we've been really focused on. One is the shift from fee-for-service medicine in the US to value-based care, and two of our portfolio companies in that space uh, recently have gone public in the last year. One's Oak Street Health, which is risk-bearing primary care for seniors. Um, and the other is Alignment Healthcare, which we took public earlier this year. That's a technology-enabled Medicare Advantage health plan. And in each of those cases, um, huge investments in the technology infrastructure that's core to enabling their business models. Big focus on uh, data ingestion. In both cases, they're pulling in um, significant data feeds. In the alignment case, I think it's over 200 sources of data. All of that is to inform, ultimately, a clinical rules engine that is trying to then apply analytics to make determinations around um, informing predictive analysis around risk. So which patients are most likely to have a preventable um, inpatient or emergency room visit, or which patients are most likely to have a conflict across two medications that may have been prescribed by two different physicians that they're seeing. COVID's been a game changer for virtual care and associated technologies. What does the world look like on a go-forward basis as we emerge from COVID? Yeah, we, we really think it was a massive acceleration for the market. Um, look, telehealth has been around for a long time. Um, if you look at the data, most people that have tried it enjoyed it and had a great experience. It just had very low awareness and as a result, very low utilization levels. And, you know, the pandemic, people were fearful of going to traditional clinical settings. And so they were almost forced to engage with this uh, new technology as a way to, to receive care and uh, satisfaction levels have continued to be extremely high. I think what's really exciting about um, that acceleration in the market is that it's also going to accelerate the innovation of those business models. And if you think about 
where telehealth was for a long time, it really was uh, getting on the phone and talking to a provider, hopefully relatively soon, and any provider would do. And then you or I would get on the phone and try to think about what information is relevant for me to give to this person I've never met over the phone to try and help them give me an informed opinion on what should I do to try and address my, my clinical need. That was version uh, 1.0. What we're really excited about is where is virtual care, more broadly defined, going to go from here? And um, a couple of companies that we've invested in, one's Doctor on Demand, we invested in last year, and more recently, earlier this year, we invested in Vita Health. In both of those cases, they're trying to offer multimodality engagement. So you can choose, am I gonna text? Am I gonna talk over the phone? Or am I gonna do a video chat with my provider? A longitudinal relationship between you and that provider or care team. So it's not talking to some random provider of care. You're talking to a care team that knows your clinical history. And then um, really cutting edge application of some cutting edge technology like machine learning or AI, trying to think about how to optimize the engagement, optimize the provider productivity, and ultimately deliver better outcomes than you'd see in any of those 1.0 mo models. And in certain areas, I think even better outcomes than traditional in-person care delivery. Now you're active globally, but it seems that Nashville is where there's an incredible amount of activity and it's an emerging uh, center for the healthcare industry. Why is that? Well, uh, I'd love to see it as someone who grew up in the South um, and, and someone who's passionate about healthcare. I think you're right. There's an enormous amount of activity within the Nashville uh, community. I think some of it goes back to um, HCA and other traditional providers that were built there. There's just been a lot of executive talent and healthcare expertise there. You've had leaders like Senator Frist that have really been investing in helping to develop the next wave of executive and entrepreneurial talent. And I think they've attracted a lot of entrepreneurs to the community. Um, and look, very recently, you had two of the most talented young entrepreneurs in um, Adam Bowler and Brad Smith, both of who recently serve um, publicly uh, within CMS, the governing body for healthcare within the US, that now as they've come out of public service, they've both relocated to Nashville. Brad was there previously, but Adam moved there. He could have moved and launched his next business anywhere he wanted, and he chose Nashville. So I think it's a compelling endorsement. You're starting to see more uh, investment organizations that are being based there. Again, more entrepreneurial activity. That'll lead to innovation, new companies being started, and hopefully that's an ecosystem that can continue to grow and expand and have a real impact on the system. You deal with a lot of entrepreneurs. They have a lot of choices these days in terms of who they engage as capital providers and partners. What advice would you give entrepreneurs? My advice for entrepreneurs is uh, it's not about the capital. Any great entrepreneur with a great business is going to have lots of great options um, uh, in terms of firms to, to, to get capital from to support the growth of their business. I think it's much more about what is that firm going to bring to help them realize the full opportunity in front of them for the business? Are they going to be a thought partner do they have experience uh, and all the benefits and lessons learned that comes from it of helping other companies like that entrepreneur's business scale over a multi-year period? So as you look to the future, what are some of the trends that you're looking at? What are some of the investment themes that you're most focused on? Yeah, you know, a lot of the, uh, where we're focused now, um, in many ways, uh, two of the areas are most excited about, again, the shift to value-based care, um, and the continued growth and expansion and innovation of virtual care delivery models. Both of those trends were dramatically accelerated within COVID. So let's first start with the, the shift from fee-for-service medicine to value-based care. So what do I mean by that? You're no longer just compensating providers of care for the units of care that they deliver, which is a volume game. And instead, um, there's a variety of forms of this, but providers are choosing to be accountable for the outcomes of the care that they deliver. Um, the easy way to think of that is you're no longer paying them to just to deliver care when someone is sick. Instead, you're compensating the physician in order to invest in the maintaining the health of that population. And so they're incentivized to spend a lot more time thinking about managing the risk of their patient base and investing in maintaining their health. Uh, the benefit of some of those models, though, is uh, you have a recurring revenue stream. So these traditional fee-for-service providers saw their revenue really dry up during COVID when people were fearful of going into the traditional clinical setting. Uh, that wasn't the case for some of our businesses in the value-based care space. So I think the disruption that you saw within um, COVID will dramatically accelerate um, the continued shift in the market from fee-for-service medicine, where traditional providers may have said, oh, it's interesting, maybe I'll get to it someday. I think a lot of them are saying, that is the future now, the system is going that way, and you're gonna see a continued acceleration of providers shifting to new revenue models as a result. Um, similarly, virtual care, 
Uh, we talked earlier about what a dramatic acceleration it was in the market, but where we're so excited is how these models are going to continue to innovate and evolve. They'll become much broader. So you're not going to just have all these different point solutions that have been defined the that have been defining the virtual care uh, space historically. It might have been phone calls with a doctor that was telehealth, price transparency, helping you understand what does it cost to get service in different locations, like an MRI, for example. It might have been care navigation, helping patients navigate care around a, a particularly complex um, uh, case. Um, and lots of others, I think you're going to see less fragmentation of that market and integration of all of those capabilities into a broader service offering that's going to feel more like virtual primary care with a longitudinal relationship between you and your primary care provider and giving you the convenience to engage with them when you want, how you want from a modality of care standpoint. Thanks so much for taking the time, Rob. Congratulations on all the success you've had in healthcare and GA overall. And it's great to see you also delivering better outcomes for the community. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure being here. I appreciate you inviting me to do it. And it does feel uh, good to do well by doing good.